exciting to begin this. Our goal with the program is to help people achieve low water, attractive looking landscapes. So you can see here, the first slide that I'm showing you is the right plant, right place, right practice. This is a low water garden. It's extremely low water garden. It is at the Denver Botanic Garden, so it does get a lot of care. Um, but I'm gonna talk to you about, we all know a lot about right plant, right place. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the right practice that we've been doing at the gardens and at some of the projects that I've been managing while running the program. We'll talk about how we've achieved that success today. So most people, when they think about a zero scape, unfortunately, what they think about and comes to mind is something like this. And this is not what we wanna see people resorting to because we know we can do so much better in our landscape. So when we think of zero scape, we don't wanna just do rock. We don't wanna just have cattle. We wanna have a lush, beautiful, colorful. We don't wanna sacrifice anything in our gardens, right? And we don't have to. The other thing that we, we need to think about is doing the same thing over and over again and, and continuing to get the same results that aren't great, which would be something like a commercial landscape here that you see, where people in the industry are just applying the same principles that they would in say temperate regions. So they're using the same plant palette that they would use back in say Cincinnati or New York. And they're using the same planting methods that they would use back and the Eastern seaboard. Well, we're in the West. So we've got to really start to examine what are the practices that make sense for us to be using given our specific climate. So I want to show you one more example of, I can do it, of a public garden. So the first slide I showed you was of a, of a garden at the Denver Botanic Gardens, which obviously gets maintained and managed um, weekly, if not daily. This is a garden that exists and is a public park. So if you know much about public parks and the staff on a public park department, there's not always a lot of folks um, available to help out there. So this is an example of an extremely low maintenance garden that has been existing for about 15 years. And so this can be done in a sense that it's not a high maintenance planting. It's not um, uh, incredibly hard to upkeep. So. Let's talk about um, how do we want to look at doing our landscapes out here now that we, we, if we think about horticulture, we think about horticulture being developed in Europe, essentially. Think about the gardens of Versailles or um, Padua. Well, when horticulture was transplanted to the United States, we were in the same similar temperate climate, similar rainfall, similar soils. Um, and as we began to migrate west, we didn't adjust our horticultural approaches to accommodate our climate here. And what we're faced with here is an extremely dry, arid or semi-arid climate, right? We get 14 inches on average yearly for precipitation. And some of that is in the form of snow. Um, the UV, because we're a mile high city, because we're up high, we've got more intense UV. Our soils are generally going to be lean. Why is that? Because we don't have forests littering the floor with leaf and breaking down and creating this rich loam soil. So we really, and then of course we have hail to deal with, um, a lot of heavy snows that can cause breakage um, and, and uh, all those things really inform how do we need to uh, work our gardens to really have a successful garden. And I don't think we can say that if we look at, and I might've missed a slide. Uh, we, we do live in a high plain steppe. I don't know if you all are familiar with the steppe regions of the world. There are no steppes in Europe. There is a steppe in Patagonia. There is a steppe climate in South Africa. There's one in Asia, which would be Mongolia. The steppe is generally speaking, just a mountain range and the high plateau that comes next to the mountain range, that mountain range is, causes a rain shadow, blocking the rain from coming over to the high plateau. And you're left with generally a high plains prairie. And that's what we live in here in North America. So like I was saying, we don't live in the, the temperate region where there's wooded forests um, and 40 inches of precipitation or more annually. Um, cloudy days, it's not incredibly arid, it's quite humid. 
totally different climate and culture for plants, right? So we, I think we need to just evaluate how effective those principles that we're using traditionally work out here and maybe think about changing the way we do things. So I'm gonna to talk to you, you probably heard the, the old mantra, right plant, right place. It's a pretty standard horticultural theme. But what about right practice? And that's all about what I'm getting at today. And I'm gonna say that right practice starts with our soils and the way we treat our soils. A plant's life is largely underground. So we really need to think about that part of a plant life. So what I will present to you today will be in stark contrast to traditional horticultural methods. Um, you know, typically we talk about adding compost to our soil and dressing the plants with wood mulch or organic material to create a rich soil. That's the goal of adding compost is to create, provide the nutrients for the plants and then putting that mulch down in order to stop the weeds from growing and then also to provide more nutrients as it breaks down. Well, if we try to fight with the soils that we have, it's a losing battle. We cannot possibly amend our soils with enough compost to really change the profile. So what I would suggest is we wanna work with what we have. So I'm gonna recommend, and what we've been doing uh, for the past five years has been using this method, along with many other folks in the industry, but we just haven't been really talking about it. Um, so we use an inorganic material to amend the soil. And that material is called squeegee rock, an odd name, but that's what they call it. It's essentially a quarter inch rock and smaller. So if you think of pea gravel, all the way down to sand. What that does when you mix that into the soil, existing soil, right? You're creating porosity. You're creating air pockets in the soil that otherwise in our very heavy clay sand soils don't exist. So or uh, clay soil won't really absorb more than a quarter inch of water per hour. So if we get a rain event and it's one inch per hour, it's still not gonna get into the plant root zone at one inches. It's gonna come in at quarter inch. So when we add the squeegee, we're creating those air pockets so that the water can go straight down into the plant root zone. And it also creates oxygen and air exchange for those plant roots. Organic matter and wood matter are not ideal for many of the xeric plants that I'm gonna suggest you use. And I have a plant list that's pretty extensive. I'm gonna share with you all. Um, Ruth will pass out after the program, right? Electronically, Electronically yes. Um, so a lot of our plants that are gonna thrive here are native to these kinds of soils. So they would actually um, not do as well if you did add compost. That's not to say you couldn't use compost and squeegee if you wanted to plant, say, a rose or a peony, it's very species dependent on what a plant needs culturally. But I would say if you're doing something xeric, the approach is using a rock mulch as an amendment. Oops. So how do we do this? There's a couple different ways to do this. I'm just putting forward um, one of the most simplest ways that I found and the most uh, least labor intensive, let's say. So if you have an area that you want to transform, you can remove whatever existing material is there, whether that be turf, plantings, wood mulch, whatever it may be. Clear that space out and add in a top dress. A top dress is where we just simply pour onto the top of the soil, squeegee rock or inorganic rock. You could use crushed granite, you could use other materials, but I'm just using a squeegee because it is highly available out here and it's equally cost-effective as mulch or compost. And you would put that squeegee rock down at two to three inches, depending on where your lip is on your concrete or what you're up against. You don't want it to be pouring off and you don't wanna have a crown on that. But the idea is to get it down on the, on the soil surface so that when you plant and as you plant, you amend the backfill with the squeegee that's on top there and then put the plant in the soil and arrange that squeegee around the base of the plant as it's mulch. Does that make sense? So that's probably the least labor intensive way that you can do this. There's lots of other ways if you're doing big, big jobs or you have machinery, but if you were doing this in your yard, this is how I would go about it. Once you're done with that, you might need to add some more squeegee because you will be using some of that squeegee into the planting hole. So you might need to add and even out the grade um, but all in all, what's great about that is you don't have to keep putting down squeegee because it doesn't break down. So it does save you money in the long run. And again, this is really gonna benefit the plants. 
The reason we use mulch and uh, the reason that we amend the soil is to benefit the plants. It's not for the look of a garden per se, it's for the plants to really survive and, and thrive. So this is not a new idea per se. Um, if you go out hiking in the field, you'll find um, penstemon is one of our most um, common genera in, in the state of Colorado. I think we have 32 species of penstemon. But a lot of those plants that are xeric, and this is one of them, in its natural environment, loves this rocky environment. That's where it likes to grow. So we're just following nature's cue. We're going not against the grain, but we're working with the soil that we have, finding plants that are going to work for us best. Here on the right, you're seeing Penstemon Coral Baby from the Plant Select Program. This was bred for its ornamental value. And you can see that it's placed in a rock bed of mulch where it's nice and happy. And, um, you know, while I've been doing this for about five years in public projects and, and right of ways and medians and lots of other places, the gardens has been using this method for a long time. The first slide that I showed you is the same picture that you're seeing on the left. That's the uh, Rhodes Water Smart Garden. Um, looks like early spring after a cutback. And you can see that soil there. It's not rich and loamy and it's not wood mulch. We also have the step garden. So I mentioned that we live in a step. So obviously our step garden replicates the step environment and also represents all the plants from across those um, areas we spoke of. But that's all using that sort of inorganic material as a soil. So the gardeners at, at Denver Botanic Gardens use this method and I'm getting out there to talk about it. Um, the top right slide is again, the same picture of that uh, uh, Kendrick Lake in Lakewood. Yes. Good question. Great question. The question was, would you put landscape fabric down? And the answer is no, I do not recommend that you do. We never use it at the gardens. I've, as a gardener for all my life, have really resented that because when you go to pull the weeds, you end up ripping the fabric anyway. So it really isn't as effective as you think. And furthermore, it's another barrier for the water not to get to the soil. It's one more barrier for the water to have to penetrate to get down to the root zone. One of the things that happens when we plant a xeric garden is we use a lot less water than we would normally, especially with a wood mulch. So that means that the, the weeds that we would have been watering aren't getting watered anymore. And what you'll find is as you reduce your water, your weeds will also reduce. So this is a job, one of the first jobs I did where the soil was extremely poor, but this is also a mile long median where we had funding to change out the soil entirely. So on the left, this is a 2018 project. This is what we were working with tree stumps, maybe existing junipers from 10 years ago, all sorts of rebar and junk in the soil. So we just took it all out and poured in a one-to-one -one inorganic rock and top garden topsoil. So 12 inches of squeegee and topsoil at a 50-50 ratio dumped into there. And then we planted it and it worked extremely well. This is on the far left is right after we planted it. The second slide is the second year and the third is the third year. And we stopped watering after the third year. It does not receive regular irrigation at all. When I say it doesn't need regular irrigation, that means it's not on a monthly timer or a weekly regime. It's turned on during the hottest periods of drought, which happen to usually be in August and September. When we have days that are 90 degrees and above, it's hot, it's windy, and so we need to supplement. If we didn't, I think plants would still survive, but it wouldn't look great. So I think you always wanna be prepared to water, but you can plan to not water. So let's talk about mulch, organic mulch, because I, while I'm talking about xeric gardens and xeric plantings, we're talking about inorganic materials amendment. But when we think of other plants that we might wanna grow that aren't native to our region, there could be a use and a place in our gardens for finely composted mulch. But the trick is just that, it is finely composted mulch. It is not large pieces of mulch. Um, it is really small mulch that is one inch and smaller. And it can be difficult to find, but you, if you can locate it, that's what you need to use. 
And furthermore, what you still want to do is you, you don't want to take away the squeegee as a soil amendment as you plant these plants. Even if you're planting, say, a rose, very traditional garden plant that needs heavy food, you can still amend that soil with the squeegee rock Again, just to allow that water to penetrate. That's the goal. You can add compost in there as well, and you probably would want to do that for a rose. So it might be 30% rock, 30% existing soil, and 30% of compost. Or maybe you top dress with compost. There's lots of different ways you could approach it. So compost isn't out and bark mulch isn't out. You just have to think about where is it appropriate and what exact mulch am I going to use? So again, this is. Uh, not totally my brainchild. This is what we've been doing at the gardens for years. We do not use gorilla hair mulch or wood chip mulch. It just doesn't break down. Um, it, it really doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So again, we want to use this for, you know, shady areas in the garden that would make sense. Maybe traditional garden plants. If you're growing um, things that you want to eat uh, that are perennial or uh, short, you know, raspberries and things like that, that would be a good use of this uh, mulch. Um, and again, uh, compost is okay. It's all very species dependent. So I would recommend if you have dry shade and you're using a lot of the plants in the palette that are going to be in dry shade are going to want that richer soil because typically a plant growing in a dry shade situation is growing under a tree in nature, right? Um, so Using uh, sort of that, that mulch is okay there. Uh, under existing trees, all, almost all trees are gonna benefit from some compost or mulch. So we don't wanna deprive our trees um, and just put squeegee all over them if they're big old existing trees. You can plant some trees in squeegee, um, but we'll, we'll talk about trees in a little bit. But under a, a large existing tree, you use um, fine mulch and then plants that are heavy feeders. You wanna use that. Approach. And the reason we're not recommending wood mulch is time and time again, I've seen going out to a landscape job and seeing six to 12 inches of layers of mulch that have never broken down, but continually people are adding because the old mantra is every year you apply two inches of mulch. Well, again, this is a practice that really works in the east and in temperate regions, but here we just don't have the moisture or biota in the soil to break this stuff down. Again, we're on the step. So we don't have the forest and the rain and the natural um, uh, uh, degradation that would occur in a woodland area. So we don't wanna recreate that on the step. So that's why we wanna use this rock mulch in general. Um, it holds water, it does absorb water. If you, especially if you use the fine gorilla hair mulch that, that will hold water in our dry environment it'll evaporate before getting down to the roots, especially if you haven't amended that soil with the rock, right? So you'll end up watering the mulch more than you will the plant. Um, and then, you know, some, again, when we're talking purely xeric plants, they will not, they will resist mulch. They will rot out. They do not want to be fed. Um, if you're using a xeric pellet, this is not a solution for any of those plants. Um, and again, this is just another example of the fine mulch. Oh, for the fine composted mulch, it has a lot of different names. Um, I usually just go and inspect it. Um, we get something called, I think it's just called simply composted mulch. Um, Ruth, do you have an idea of what they might call it depending on the vendor? Yeah, I have to get back to you on that because we uh, we buy it from save -a tree and they have a very finely composted mulch but I cannot find it bagged anywhere and I've tried so it's it's a hard product to come by and I appreciate that that's a challenge but it um, if you look you can find it I want to pause actually before we go on and take maybe a few questions um, because I know that was a lot of information that's really in stark contrast to what we normally would be thinking about doing in our gardens. So do we want to put on the video or have a mic or? Yeah. Pause. So does anyone have any comments, questions, concerns about what I've just spoken about? Yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I put them all there. Did I just pick them all right? Um, I don't think so. I wonder um, how they were planted, and you might want to evaluate if they're were pro rightly planted. Uh, you know, the root collar, which is where it starts to flare, needs to be right at grade. And a lot of times I'm seeing people plant it high or low. If it's planted too low, you're going to see the roots coming up, and that's what it sounds like. Um, you can use some fine mulch around that tree. And you could also ring it with some bricks or something like that to make sure that, you know, the, it's avoided by the strings when being maintained. Weed whacker is terrible, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's an aesthetic question, maybe. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. Does anyone have any questions about the squeegee rock and, and conflicts with that information? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, they do. Pioneer rock providers nearby have squeegee. It's readily available in all regions that I'm aware of in Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. 16. We'll give them business because they're a local, they support our locals. Happy Life also has a landscape yard. And then the next closest one, there's a pioneer, Windsor and Timber Rock. And do any of those people, I'm assuming they do not, or you said, have that really fine home? They might. It's it's actually location dependent. Like I said, we've used Save a Tree. Um, but as far as finding fine mulch, I think Ewing landscape, I don't know if that's up here or not. You have to just do your due diligence because I work on a lot of commercial projects and I don't do a lot of residential because as a public entity, we, we want to devote our time to public projects. I don't have as much insight as to, uh, residential sourcing. Um, but I, I'm sure that if you dig around, you can find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I've heard that term too, but I don't use that and I'm not familiar. Yeah. I've been using that term. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but um, anyway, if you ever hear, send us a message that okay. says, here's who has it, you got our emails. And I do like that soil pep. I do use that for top dressing and I annuals. Think, and. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Question in the back. I think they have multiple locations throughout the U.S. Um, we're in Denver, obviously, so I'm at the York Street facility, and so we use, I think, somewhere in Littleton. But you can Google them; you should be able to find them. And we'll be doing some research to better understand why squeegee seems to work, why this inorganic material seems to work really well in our gardens. Thus far, we haven't been able to put any resources towards scientific data, but we're beginning to do that. And so hopefully in the forthcoming years, we'll have some, some real data for you um, agronomy nerds out there to study and understand why this works. One more question. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend it just be simply because they need so much food. Um, you know, I think, you'd want to use compost for sure, right? For whatever vegetables you're growing or um, some form of humus material, manure, whatever. Um, but I mean, I suppose you could use it as a mulch, maybe. I've never tried it. I don't do a lot of urban agriculture gardening. So maybe you could report back to us if you do give it a shot. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I mean, you can make your whole entire front yard into a planting uh, landscape. So you want to remove the sod. So the question is, how do I, you know, what do I do to my yard when it's just all sod? 
And you want to get a sod cutter. It's a really easy way to do it or hire someone to do that with a sod cutter and just remove it. And with what you will have removed, you'll be left with a three inch depth that you can fill with a squeegee and then plant into. And you might want to accent it with some walkways or steppers or something so it's not just one big thing and you can get to the plants. Okay, one more question. Yeah. So backfill is essentially a technical term for when you dig a hole, what you take out. Oh, yeah. So what I'm saying is you take that backfill and you make sure that it's a good one-to-one -one ratio of the squeegee that you're putting in, at least 30%. And this is just eyeballing it. I mean, you're not measuring up, but you want to at least amend about a 30% of rock into that. And if that means ditching some of that soil that you dug out, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, I think I want to go forward and we can take questions at the end. So this is a garden um, we just did in April 2022. I helped to design the perennial walk at Denver Botanic Gardens, York Street. We had a really aged planting that was 25, 30 years old, and it kind of had grown outgrown itself and the integrity of the original design. So we took everything out and we used squeegee. We used about 60 tons of squeegee. And you can see here, this is a picture of us on the left planting it in April this past year, last season. And we planted pretty small. We tried to get as many perennials and quart sizes as we could. Nothing really went in at five gallon, three gallon, not many. We had one, a couple trees that were bald and burlapped, but largely we planted really small using that squeegee. And this is, April that same year, you can see the picture on the right. So if you're worried about, and a lot of people very well could be, having a rock landscape, yuck. We don't wanna look like the zero scape on the front page that I showed you earlier where they don't even try to plant. Don't worry, it will quickly fill in because the squeegee rock has been so effective, it just grows in really fast. So this is one year's growth. Um, and of course, um, these are all pretty xeric plants. We adapted the, the profiles uh, and the plant palette to be really low water plants, but still really, really colorful and somewhat of a traditional, but Western um, English garden. So planting small does a couple of things. Um, it just allows that plant to get established quickly because once the roots can support the shoots, then that plant is more likely to survive whatever comes at it, right? So if you get an equilibrium in the, the root to shoot ratio, which means having a smaller plant so it doesn't have, if you get a five gallon plant, the roots are gonna be cut off or it will have been grown in a container rather than out past the drip line where it needs to grow. So the smaller you plant, the lower the attrition rate. And the other thing I would say is a lot of times, even when you put in brand new irrigation, it will fail. Drip irrigation will get clogged. It will get kicked out of the way. And if that plant doesn't get the irrigation it needs and it's top heavy, it's gonna die. So the quicker it can get to be self-sufficient, the better. And the quicker it'll start to fill in and grow as you can see from this picture. So thinking about right plant, right place. We've kind of talked about right practice, but right plant, right place is tricky too because a lot of our plants come from the East and the West growers. Portland and uh, you know the Pacific Northwest is ideal for growing plants with all the rain and the rich soil that they have. Same with um, the Midwest and the East Coast. It's a really ideal place to be cropping and growing horticulturally in mass. So what's happened is the plants that do really well here are largely unknown by large um, suppliers. So we really need to make sure we're shopping locally to, to source some of our plants, but they are out there. And I do big jobs, a mile long median say, where I've found sources locally that are wholesalers or even just local garden centers that carry the plants that we wanna use. A lot of times we see contractors or even just residents, you know, folks that say, oh, I had this when I grew up, I wanna have it here. Might wanna rethink that and make sure that it really is a good plant for here because not everything that you may have grown up with somewhere else is gonna do well. Um, I see a lot of contractors when we do, um, if, you go, if you buy a new home, what you'll see is plants that are really readily available. There's hundreds of them, they put them in and they don't care that it's the wrong species. Um, 
So, and I think, again, a lot of people just really aren't even aware of what's out there. So you're gonna get this great plant list. It's gonna have lots of information on it. Um, before we get to the plant list, just a reminder, if you're not familiar with Plant Select, it's an awesome program. We, um, Denver Botanic Gardens and CSU, work together to select plants that meet a very regimented criteria. And then we vote on them and we talk about them and we spend lots of time making sure they're the right plant to get into the program. And right now we have like almost 200 different species of plants in the program that are approved by um, our entities. So they're really easy, low hanging fruit. If you've never gardened before and you wanna try it, this is a good place to start. Go to the Plant Select website or look for the Plant Select tag when you're buying your plants. Um, I'm going to show you uh, a right plant, right place list. Um, but first I'm gonna talk about some other plants that I see used all the time. I just wanna remind you that there's some resources out there that you can find. Um, I don't know if that link is showing up here. The Missouri Botanical Garden is an excellent resource to, to learn and explore about plants and their native and cultural con conditions. So a couple of plants that I see again and again in the landscape and as I do peer review projects for landscape contractors and industry folks are really not to be used here because they actually like wet feet. Does anyone know what wet feet is? It's when it wants to grow in a swamp. It actually likes growing in a marsh. How many marshes do you think we have? front range. So these plants are eastern plant species and generally speaking what I like to advise people to do is look for plants that are native to North America but to western North America. If it says it's from the eastern North America it's probably getting a lot of water. It's probably if it's you know east of the Mississippi it's 40 inches of precipitation. Um, so Echinacea purpurea there's all sorts of other echinaceas out there. You can find other species that will do well and still have that, that beautiful cone flower. Um, other plants I see Carl Forrester reg regularly used again and again. There's lots of other options out there. Don't feel like you're stuck and you have to stick with these same plants that just because Lowe's or Home Depot may have them. If you go to a new nursery, you might find some new ideas and some plants that will work just as well. So if you go to the Missouri Botanical Garden, they will tell you, you can Google the plant, put in Missouri Botanic, and it'll tell you all of its native uh, history, unless it's a cultivated hybrid, but you can just Google the genus and learn about it. And I've linked that there. For example, the Echinacea purpurea, I used to study medicinal plants and that was one of the plants we studied. In Indiana, where it was wet, they grew in the yard, you know. Here, they really like more water. They also are subject to uh, disease, phytoplasmic disease, and then to go flower because of that. Um, but you can use the Echinacea angustifolia, Echinacea paradoxa, Echinacea pallida. All of those are seeded varieties that you can find easily in seed catalogs. And you may be able to find them at um, an heirloom plant store. But that's our native Western Echinacea that actually really likes dry, rocky soils and will not live in a, a swamp or a marsh. So it's angustifolia, Echinacea angustifolia. There's another one called Pallida, P-A-L-L-I-D-A, and Paradoxa, just like Paradox, Paradoxa. Same with the Liatris, I see that used all the time. It's a wet foot plant. We wanna move away from that and use our native Liatris punctata. Has the same qualities ornamentally, but it's just gonna do a whole lot better for you. And it's gonna attract our native pollinators. So twofold win. There's lots of plants out there right now that you can find at a big box store that um, you might not know are incredibly xeric. So I've just shown a couple of my favorites, the butterfly pincushion flower at the top. Uh, and then we've got our native Coreopsis. Be mindful that there are many Coreopsises out there, lots of species, lots of cultivars. Um, this is Lanceolata. That's our native plant. Uh, both of those bloom May or June or October. Hard working plants in the garden. And those can be found at Home Depot even, or something like that. These will be on the plant list that I give you. Um, Echinops is one of the cooler plants that uh, I don't see used too often, but it's really a neat looking uh, globe thistle. Um, it's the rounded plant flower there. 
Then we've got yarrow, which is uh, achillea. All sorts of achilleas do well out here. They're native. They're again, a really long bloomer, June through October. And I will say it's funny that I found plants in the legume family do really well out here. And so what you're seeing there is the uh, pea family. This is a baptisia, baptisia australis. It's in the Fabaceae or Legumaceae family. Um, for whatever reason, there's a ton of plants that do great in that family. So if you're really a plant nerd, you can nerd out on that. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you this plant list. I'm not sure that I have a, an image of the plant list, but what you'll see when you get the plant list is you'll see the genus, the species, the cultivar, the common name, and then you'll see a water designation and it'll be moderate, dry, or xeric. I made these up based on my experience and the experience of the gardeners that I work with at Denver Botanic Gardens. There is no USDA designation like we have for zone four, five, six, and seven. There's no water designation that exists that I'm aware of. So these are my designations that go along with the plant schedule that I'm, sh I'm gonna share with you. But essentially what we're doing is you're gonna get down if you use the plants on this plant list and the squeegee rock integrated into your soil, you're gonna get down to using maximum of two inches of irrigation per month. Does anyone know what Kentucky bluegrass uses per month? Four to 10 inches per month. So you're gonna save at least 60% on your water bill and conserve 60% of water and your plants are gonna be much more exciting than just green grass especially if you're not using it. There's nothing wrong with turf if you're using it, but if you're not, you're wasting money. Okay. So um, the plant list is um, parceled out in a couple different pages. So one section is xeric plants. So xeric plants is gonna include just native plants, step plants, and any plants that are really just adapted to dry conditions. And often you can tell that a plant is xeric by it having silver, uh, foliage or having very small and fine foliage or very hairy or waxy leaves. These are modes of defense against losing water, evapotranspiration. If you think about a plant leaf, when we think about Echinacea purpurea, it has a flat wide leaf that's pretty hairless. When we look at Echinacea angustifolia, the leaf is much more narrow and it's very hairy. It stops that water from evaporating. So you can look for things like that. California poppy, um, Centranthus, very common plant. It's actually native to the Mediterranean, but it likes drought. Um, so those are a couple of plants that would be on the list. You're gonna see some native plants. And again, I'm gonna limit my native plants to being not just in Colorado because the plant does not care where the borders are, um, they, but they grow in ecosystems. So if it's in the Western North American region and native to that space, that's a plant we wanna use. So here we've got a couple of penstemon, Columbine, our state flower, rabbit brush, the dwarf variety, lead plant, and Engelmann's daisy. And again, these are all going to be in that xeric page uh, plant list. I'm also going to give you some cool step plants. So these are two plants that are from South Africa. One of the neat things about my job is we get to travel to other step regions to do plant research and find out what other plants we can bring to our palate to broaden our species. Um, that are available in our industry. So red hot poker or nephophia is one of them. Wonderful plant, a lot of new cultivars are coming out and it is starting to be propped in mass out in the east. So it should be moving out here and we should be seeing that. And then Delisperma paniote calatus, I think brought this back from South Africa and it's just a wonderful ground cover, evergreen, great little flowers. It's not the same um, ice plant is what you think of in California. That is an invasive plant. This is called Delosperma. It's the genus. Then we have some, what I'm calling traditional dry loving plants. And those would be things like iris, peony, shrub roses, lavender. These are plants that actually you could grow anywhere. They're incredibly versatile. And these would also be great plants for a rain garden, if you want to call it that out here. <laughs> but if you do have um, an area where you do get flooded or you have a downspout. These are plants that would withstand it because they grow in both the east and the west. Um, actually, I think lavender does much better out here than it does in the east and, and midwest. But yarrow, um, lilac, all sorts of goodies. So if you, if you really want a traditional looking garden, you can still get that. You don't have to totally adopt a western aesthetic, although I think there's nothing wrong with that. Some people may 
just really want to stick with what they know. And you can do that. So there will be a page for that. I've got a page for a couple pages for dry shade because that's always a difficult one, right? Um, there's a lot of cool plants for dry shade. Um, if you haven't been to our gardens and you walk Shady Lane in the spring, I would say April and May, it's really gorgeous. Um, if you should come down to York Street. Um, what you're seeing there is Brunera, which is false um, forget-me-not. You got a red twig dogwood or cornus species. Uh, this plant is actually a wet foot plant, but it will survive it because it's native here. It will survive here, but it will not thrive in full sun. So put it in the shade and I think you'll see it do a lot better. And then our native Mahonia repens, this is a broadleaf evergreen that is really underused. Um, it turns this beautiful color in the, in the winter and it never drops its leaves. So it's a really nice plant to have for color in the garden. And then for those of you that may have a mountain home or you have friends that live in high elevation, I've got a special list just for that too. Because as we go up into the mountains, it gets colder, shorter time period for growth. So you've got to think about things like um, bloom time, pick early bloomers. You want to think about fire resistant plants, if that's become an issue. Um, but there's a lot of plants that are really cool that only do well up there, like lupin and delphinium, because they aren't blasted with the heat. So there's some cool things that you can do with high elevation as well. So I want to talk quickly about seeding as well. Um, this is a really effective way for the woman who has the sod, wants to remove that. There's a great thing that you can do simply just by not even putting the squeegee down. When you seed native plants, they like native soil. So there's no need to change the soil. But what you want to do is you want to find the right plants. So here's a couple pictures of the retivita, which is a Mexican hat. The dahlia, which is um, a really important pollinator species. Uh, blue flax, penstemon, there's all sorts of wildflowering forbs and grasses and mixes that you can put down. And what I would recommend is if you were to remove some turf and want to put that down, um, you put the seed down in July or August or September or October or even November, let it sit. Plants, seeds like to naturally get scarified, which is basically taking acid to the seed in order to make the germination process begin. That means a bird will eat it. Think about that. In the, in the lab, what we do is we put acid on it to get that plant to, to propagate. But in nature, nature's doing it by plants being eaten, seeds being eaten, going in the stomach, coming out. So we want a lot of plants, plants will need that in order to germinate. That's why we wanna leave it out all winter. And the other thing they do is stratify in cold. So we'll put them in the freezer, here we just leave them outside. That's something that triggers their chemical makeup. So they say, okay, it's time to go. And some seeds won't even germinate for three years. They might need a longer time. And you'll think, well, I threw that down for nothing. Three years later, you'll get a big whoosh of whatever it might be. So be patient, um, be thoughtful about your seed mix, but it is a good option for large spaces where you have no idea and you don't have the budget because it can be relatively cheap. You wanna start watering these in June till they germinate and then water regularly. Um, I have a Western best practices guide that goes through seeding in specifics that you can take a look at. It's available on our website. Maybe Ruth, you could pass that out. Um, so again, think about the species, seed and fall. Key thing is you wanna, if you have a small area, I literally just stomp all over it after I put the seed down, but you could take a back of a rake and just make sure that seed soil contact is really happening. That's really important and increases germination by 60 some percent. Um, if you wanna remove some turf, as I think the way things are going, we're seeing a lot of incentives to do that. Um, as I said, I don't think turf is bad, but if you're not using it, consider a replacement and you can use another turf. There's a grandma buffalo mix and Ruth has an amazing display in her garden. Um, that you can take a look at in the spring. And then you could do the native grasses. You can also do, one of my favorites is the dog tough grass. If you have a dog and he likes to run around and you know make a mess like dogs do, this is actually a great grass that's super resistant to dogs. No spots, no browning. Um, it's a Bermuda grass, it spreads. It, it comes, um, you don't put it down in sod is the only trick. We're working on that. We're trying to get it in sod. 
but you put it down in plugs and after one season, you've got a really wonderful green, warm season grass, does need full sun. It's a great bee plant for pollinating and it requires two inches of water per month. So way reduced from our Kentucky bluegrass. And again, if this is great if you have a right of way in a public space where it's getting used as a dog place anyway. I just put that out there and then it won't be just brown. So I wanna talk quickly about trees because this is a whole nother ball of wax. But you know, trees being on the step, we know that they don't really grow in the prairie. So we can see this map um, and the green is the mountains. So we don't really have a lot of native trees. The trees that we have are native to waterways. So we see cottonwoods, we see willows, we see uh, poplars, we see uh, things growing along a, a creek or creekside or a river. That's where we see our trees naturally. So when we think about trees, we always wanna make sure we're providing additional water and irrigation throughout their life because they won't naturally just grow and pop up in the middle of the prairie. So um, I do amend the squeegee uh, just the same when I'm planting trees. If they're a new tree and they're going into a xeric bed, there are certain trees that are xeric. Um, they come from Mongolia or they're, they could be um, just extremely tolerant. There's very few species, but you know they, they can go into the uh, organ, uh, inorganic bed. You can also plant them um, as a, a uh, person had mentioned they had planted their tree and put some wood mulch around it. You can use the fine composted mulch, especially if it's in a yard or something like that, that's fine. But using the squeegee in the backfill up to 30%, it's still gonna be helpful with the, the water being able to penetrate. So that's again, why we're using that. When you're planting, pay attention to the root color. Um, you wanna wrap the young trees because of our high UV, we get a lot of splitting and cracking especially certain species are a little more uh, susceptible to that, but make sure you're wrapping those young trees in the winter and taking that off in the summer. If you don't take it off in the summer, you'll get infestation, small issues with that, but in the winter, you're just protecting it like a sunscreen. Two to three seasons, maybe, yeah. And then again, just make sure you're watering them separately. Um, this is the Plant Nerds Bible. Manual of Woody Landscape Plants by Michael Durr. If you want to get nerded out, you should buy this book. And if you don't want to get nerded out, you can take my word for it and plant these top 10 trees. Um, this is also Al Rollinger's word. Al Rollinger's dedicated 50 years of his life to surveying trees in Denver. And he came back with a report that showed us that Gymnocladus is uh, the top surviving tree after 50 years of surveying inventory. And then we have uh, cold rotaria, which is um, golden rain tree, which is a wonderful, nice tree. Uh, all these are available. Oak is Quercus. Oaks are always a solid bet. Great trees to have in the yard. And I think Plant Select is coming out with some new oaks for their program. Sephora Japonica is a little less um, found in common nurseries, but you can buy it. And I think they recently changed the Latin name. But usually the nurseries are behind on that. So just go with Sephora Japonica. It's in the elm family um, and it's a really nice, easy tree to, uh, to grow in your yard. And then Ascalus is a horse chestnut um, and that has a beautiful flower. Those were the top five surviving species. So if you're looking for a tree, you'll notice I didn't list so, uh, you know, a maple in there, guys. Maples are from the east temperate regions. They often grow in the understory as sh shade plants until they reach their peak and surpass. Um, they like really rich acid soil. We have none of that. So when you're planting your maples, you're seeing them fail. It's just very stressful for them here. So there are some maples you can use, but probably best to stay away from them. This is one tree that's really great to use. Uh, the Celtus occidentalis is a hackberry. It can take our rainfall and be fine. I would supplement it still, but this plant actually, this tree is so tough that it can tolerate only 14 inches of precipitation a year. There's not many trees that can do that. Now it's not necessarily native to the West because I haven't seen it propping up in the field, but we, they do very well in commercial situations and, and out in the urban setting. It's a great street tree. 
If you're gonna do a maple, this is a good one because it's from, um, it's a species from Mongolia, which is another steppe area. So this is the hot rings maple that Plant Select has in its program. Uh, so that's a good one. And then I know a lot of people like aspens, but remember that we're a little bit lower than where they wanna be. So if you have to plant an aspen, I understand, but try and think about putting that on the east side of your building where it's not blasted with the west and the south and maybe look at this cultivar, which has proven to do a little bit better at our lower elevation. These are better for high elevation planting. 6,500 is where we wanna plant these. That's where they naturally start to crop up. This is a great alternative to that. It has a white bark and a yellow fall color. This is called the New Mexican Privet. It's a little bit more shrub-like because um, it's a multi-trunked, um, but it, it gets to 15, 20 feet as it grows in. And if you prune it up, it can be quite lovely and really take those ornamental features of the aspen and put them in the right place here in Denver and Greeley. And so I'm gonna just kind of walk through some of the projects that we've done as I close. Um, like I said, we've been doing this for about five years and we're continually doing more and more projects. Um, we love doing medians and parks and very exciting places like that. Uh, this is Cherry Creek North. This is typically what you'll see people having because they just didn't ever address it differently. Wood mulch and a shrubbery. So we took that out and we planted, this is right after we planted it. This was in 2021. I haven't been able to be back to take pictures. So this is just after we planted it. But what they did is they used the squeegee rock there, you can see. And I will be updating pictures and putting them on our website this year. So you can come visit and see me. Or you can go down to Cherry Creek and shop and eat and check it out. <laughs> uh, this was in um, Evans, City of Evans uh, Municipal Complex. So they had their zero escape. And they've been awesome to work with. They've changed out 25,000 square foot of bluegrass. And this was a uh, planting that same area where we planted right after we planted. Again, you can see that squeegee there. The goal is we're gonna get plant coverage and vegetative coverage all throughout. So you're not gonna be looking at that squeegee. When I go back this year, I expect to see at least 70% coverage of vegetation. Um, so it, it always, we don't have a control on the watering and the maintenance of the project. So it can be a little difficult to, to get that, but. I think by this year, this will be its third year in, it should be pretty happy. Here's a right of way, perfect example of useless turf. Watering, watering, watering. Town of Severance, which isn't too far off. Um, we did a great job over there with Northern Water, who provides grant money for um, public projects that remove turf. And here we've got um, a really nice right of way that's filled in. Um, this is a year later. Uh, it also became a plant select demonstration garden. So it gets signage and people can visit it and learn about the plants. So it's been really fun, um, really kind of learning about this and getting this program off its feet. I, I don't know if you've seen me before, I have talked at one of the really Waterwise uh, events before, but I'm glad to be back with new and updated info. And um, thanks so much for your time. I'll take any questions now, thank you. Some of them are on drip, some of them are on overhead. So the chief Evans has done overhead as I, I would request them to do. The town of Evans did drip and failed. And my, my concern with drip, and there is no one way or the other that's right or wrong, for sure. But I would say that um, I like to be able to visually see the water running to make sure it's actually happening. And I can't do that with drip because it's underneath or, and, and then it's harder to fix and assess the problem. If I do overhead, First of all, the plants aren't going to need that and after they get big enough. So if you're worried about the plants blocking the, the water spray, well, that's not really an issue because once they're established, you're going to be not watering them until just during the drought. Um, so that's that's just my take, but it depends on each person. Um, so you're not watering the rock, you're watering the plants. And if you're, so with drip, you're definitely not watering the rock, right? Because you would have the drip hose going. Well, I think not necessarily, you're, you're gonna work with an irrigation specialist, which I'm not. 
Um, but, you know, we've used, uh, for example, Netafin, where um, it is like a drip system, but like, like an upgrade. Um, we've used pop-up heads in our gardens at the, the Denver Botanic Gardens, and that's what we go to use. We don't use drip. We also hand water if you're averse to, to doing that. Um, again, you want to program this so that you're only watering for, say, 15 minutes a week for the first two years. And that's probably overkill. I would say in May, April, May, June, maybe once every two weeks for 15 minutes, turn it off. Because actually, most people are overwatering. That's why things are dying. So 15 minutes every two weeks until it gets really hot, and then maybe once a week for 15 minutes during August and September, back it off in October. This is off the cuff, guys. Don't hold me to it. But um, that's kind of what my watering schedule looks like at my garden. Um, and this is with various ear plants. No, um, the, the, my, this is my third year with this garden, and I'll be turning it off. I'm going to water it in August and September. Say again. Well, we we do, you do, but they're really easy to pull out because the soil is really uh, malleable, especially after you've watered it. If you let the squeegee dry out, like I do, because I'm obsessed with water, uh, you might want to water it before you go out there and weed, because it can get a hard, crusty top when it's really dried out. That doesn't mean it's cement. It doesn't mean that it's it's bad for the plants. Just that's what happens when the sand and the rock and the clay all don't get watered. Just like we see cracks in a very dry region as it gets drier and drier and the soil breaks up, that's what you're you're seeing there, just natural. But the weeds are reduced because you're not watering like you would be if you had mulch and a different palette. And what I find is as the, if I have a berm area and the weeds collect along the edges where the water rolls off. Where they're getting the most water is where I get the weeds. Where I don't water, or the water doesn't run off and stay, I don't get weeds. I also can use uh, pre-emergent sometimes. Um, you wanna just be careful if you're using product, follow the rules, and um, you know you wanna be thoughtful about species that might be very sensitive. Not really with the Xeric palette. Um, fertilizer and xeric plants, they're a need. Not for xeric plants, not for step plants. If you're growing roses, lilac, some of the things on the other list, you might want to consider um, stakes for trees or something like that. But um, always do that in the spring or fall, never in the summer. I don't believe he does. No. What's maintaining a garden like this? So actually there's a lot of variety in terms of maintaining a garden. Um, I do a lot of median design where nobody should be out there, it's not safe. So I use plants like manzanita where the uh, advice would be never touch this plant. That's the maintenance for it. If you go to plantselect.org and with the plant list that I'm giving you, I'm giving you an annual maintenance chart, which is just once a year you do this, it's once a year. What you're going to do is weed the first year or two on a weekly basis, maybe bi-weekly basis. Um, you're going to cut everything back in the fall. This is the, sh or sorry, in the spring. This is a short hand of what you need to do. Otherwise, leave it alone. Everything that needs to be cut back gets cut back in the spring. Leave it up all winter. You don't need to be pruning anything. You don't need to deadhead anything. You don't need to do any of that unless you want to. Yeah. So what I know of bluegrass is that's where Japanese beetle grubs live. So if you're using dog tough grandma grass or uh, buffalo grass, I do not think that will be attractive to them. So do you, is that a, is that a, but the, is the dog tough is a Bermuda grass. And then buffalo and grandma are our native grasses. Yes. Um, 
Um, question is, is, once the garden is established, what's the watering like? So if it's fully xeric and I prep the soil right, then I, it is probably like 15 minutes every 10 to 14 days. And then if we get rain, I pay attention because if it's windy, it's even drier. You know, if it's cloudy, not so bad. So it's really kind of a not programmable kind of thing. The best thing to do is get out there and stick your hand in dirt. And if it feels wet, don't touch it. If it feels dry as a bone, water it. But if it's moist, don't do it because actually that plant is probably getting overwatered. Any other questions? Okay, thanks so much for your time, everyone. Thank you. All right. Um, I just want to mention that we do have some more um, classes coming up. So the next one is I know we'll talk about this over here so Annie doesn't hear how to convert to drip because it is appropriate in some <laughs> it is. places. It is. It is. Um, so that's coming up next, and that's going to be Rita in our office. Um, and I got to thinking about the plant list. It's on 11 by 17, which unless you're um, working and have access to a printer like that, most people don't have a printer at home. I don't have a printer at home. So what I thought I could do is I'll send it to you as a PDF. If you can't print it and you want to print it, let me know. I'll just print out a bunch and my office is upstairs and I'll leave them with Aaron at the front desk. And I can do that for you for those if you want a big printout. But otherwise, you'll have it electronically too. Um, Don Ehar from Pawnee Buttes is going to be here in April to talk about how to seed a native lawn, the buffalo, the blue grandma. So um, go to the same place to sign up, grillygub.com slash landscape lecture. If you're interested in the Life After Lawn program, that's getting up and running. And that's that turf replacement with um, a rebate, dollar a square foot. So, and I know a lot of you, well, a few of you are in here. I know we're already part of it. Uh, those bulk landscape yards, they have compost. I like to send people to those because I, and I have to buy potting soil sometimes, but I hate all that plastic and bags. So you can have a way to get it at the landscape yard. That's the best way to do it, unless you just need a small amount. All right. Thank you. Very Thanks, much. guys. Really good. Thank you. Yeah.